All right. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Maybe third time's charm. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. There, that's what I'm talking about. All right. Thank you for that wonderful meal tonight. Matt Vermeer and cooking team. Thank you very much. All right. I know some of you, I know some of you are still eating, and that's okay. But we need to go ahead and get our song started tonight. We're going to sing Revelation song tonight. Who knows Revelation song? There's some people. We're going to sing this Sunday. All right, we're going to do it Sunday. So you're going to learn it tonight if you haven't heard it before. Oh, I think you're going to know the tune. And then that way you'll be familiar and you can help lead the congregation on Sunday, right? Let's do a share screen. Oops. Hang on. There we go.
All right, great job, everybody. All right. Oops, no, 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 no. That's not... There we go. Okay, uh, for prayer concerns tonight, uh, I have a few to mention, and if you have any, please, uh, please, please share them with us before we get started. The first is... A number of you know Jim Humphreys. Uh, Jim is a uh, elder out at Big Creek Presbyterian Church, and his family, the Foremans, have been very involved in this congregation as well. And Jim had knee replacement surgery this morning. Uh, Dr. Burton did that, Curtis. And then tomorrow morning, Steve Lane, very, very early, uh, before it's even sunup, is having his hip replaced by Curtis. So we need to pray for Jim and Steve and Dr. Burton. And also, um, I had, a, I'm in a reading group with Michelle Harlia's dad, Milton Baumgartner. And a number of you know Michelle. Michelle and her husband. Oh my gosh. I can't think of his name. Christy, Christy thank you. Uh, our missionaries in Bucharest, Romania. And Michelle has been very sick with long term COVID. They couldn't figure out what was happening with her. And they've just recently found on a scan that she has. She has scar tissue on her brain, and the, and the scar tissue is pressing down on the brain matter, and it's causing seizures and other medical issues. She is in Vienna, Austria right now at, at a university hospital, uh, having more tests run and hoping to be able to have a procedure done very, very soon. But this is in God's hands. We need to, uh, to pray that she's able to have this procedure and do well with it. Are there other concerns tonight to lift up? Okay, well, let's pray. let's pray. God, we love you, and we do thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you that we can uh, gather together tonight around the table, around fellowship and food and fun and conversation. And we also lift up to you, God, this time of study. When we opened up your word, and when we experience how everything in it points us to your son, the redeemer of the cosmos, the Lord Jesus Christ. God, tonight, uh, in particular, we, we have uh, some people to lift up to you. Uh, in prayer, we lift up Jim Humphreys to you, God, who had knee replacement surgery this morning. And we lift up Steve Lane, who's having hip replacement surgery tomorrow morning. And then we lift up Curtis Burton, who'll be, who has, uh, who's already operated on Jim and will be on Steve. And God, we pray that you already begin the healing process on Steve and that you restore Jim to health and that you protect Curtis as he goes in uh, and does these operations. We lift up Michelle Harlia to you, God. Uh, we, we thank you for the ministry uh, that you have placed on Christy and Michelle and their children's hearts as they live in Bucharest, so very, very far from family and loved ones. And Michelle is very sick. She is not well. And God, we pray your healing hand to rest upon her. We thank you, Lord, for the doctors and, and the support staff uh, at the hospital in Vienna. We pray, Lord, that they're able to, uh, to discover uh, exactly what this problem is that's been plaguing her and that they'll be able to uh, to bring about a resolution uh, to that in the least invasive way possible. 
So God, we pray your blessing upon Michelle and Christy and their family. We lift up Steve and Jim and their families. And we lift up all those in our community, nation, and world of the war that's taking place in Israel and Gaza, of the war in Ukraine and uh, between Ukraine and Russia and all of the other troubled spots. God, all those who are sick, all those who are hurting, all those who are feeling alone and desperate and sad and broken, we place all within your care for you are the great physician. We pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, uh, so we can be dismissed now. So if you're heading upstairs, please head upstairs. If you want to get rid of your garbage, this is a good time. I'm going to hand out, I'm going to hand out a sheet. Now, if you're watching online and you would like one of these handouts, you have to contact the church and we can sit, we can scan it and, and email you a copy. Okay. No problems. Got to introduce yourself. Okay. Are you welcome to say it up there? I went to see him one time, and he had this story, and it's like, he opened the top, and we're like, what do you want? All right. So, a, a couple of items, folks. Uh, did I give you one, Marsha? Okay. A couple of items as we get started tonight. First of all, uh, for the Essential 100 reading plan, reading challenge for this week, we read from the Psalms and we read from Proverbs, which is wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And we are very blessed tonight because we have an Old Testament scholar with us. Dr. Robert Bergen is a distinguished Old Testament professor emeritus at Hannibal LaGrange University. Uh, he is he is highly respected in his field, especially within Davidic studies. And I wanted to share a couple of things that he's actually been involved with. A lot of folks in Hannibal don't realize what they have on their hands here. And I mean that in the best of ways. <laughs> this is a copy of the New Living Translation. And, uh, and Dr. Bergen was on the translation committee for is it the book of judges no no exodus, exodus. Uh, so he was on the translation team for exodus in the new living translation in the apologetics study bible which is a uh, the holman series he did the study notes for one and two samuel i believe is that correct yeah you think so <laughs> okay he's, he's very humble by the way and also uh if you ever go, if you're ever looking for a Bible commentary, you want to go to a place called bestbiblecommentaries.com. Bestbiblecommentaries.com. And there they have every single book in the Bible, as well as many other different kinds of subjects and topics. And they rate uh, commentaries uh, by, uh, and, and these ratings are done by lay people, by pastors, by scholars. And it's just, uh, well, I don't know how they do it, but anyway, they do it. And the number one rated commentary for First and Second Samuel is written by Dr. Robert Bergen. That, that, that's an amazing thing. So, yeah. So we're, we're very fortunate to have him with us tonight. And uh, with that, I will step out of the way.
and I will hand him the microphone. Let's see. There you go. Yeah. You're gonna have all this space here. Okay. I just gotta move mine. Yeah. It's fine. Now we do have stars up here. If anybody asks, answers a really tough question, they get a star. <laughs> You're not kidding. There are stars. Um, is this an every week thing? And what's this? Yeah, not a bad idea. I didn't use that with my Hebrew class. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Annabelle Grange. Well, it is a privilege to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, thanks to the friends who came, uh, some of you we've known, Martha and I, for the best part of 35 years and more, and um, some of you are, are newer, uh, but it is uh, always a joy to be able to share God's word with people who love the Lord, and, and so let's do that tonight. I understand that Mark, uh, Pastor Hughes, uh, months ago started a, a great con a, a great series for Wednesday night is it like a hundred verse what, what is a hundred passages or something like that mark a hundred passages 50 from the Old Testament 50 from the new wonderful and um, I can't believe that you gave equal credit to the Old Testament uh, as you did to the New Testament oh I didn't write the plan <laughs> <laughs> but you are using <laughs> that's very impressive yes it is um the <clears throat> five of those chapters in the Old Testament uh, that you all are working your way through relate to the books of Psalms and Proverbs. These are two of the most beloved and two of the most used books in all of the Old Testament by Christians today. And there's a reason. These things are, uh, first of all, they're God's word, okay? Uh, enough said right there. But beyond that, uh, they, they do... Uh, glorify Jesus and and the wisdom that God built into the universe uh, built in by the creator of the universe himself and the New Testament tells us that the creator is Jesus uh, over the years I've, I've learned that if you leave Jesus out of the Old Testament you've missed the purpose for the Old Testament uh, it really does point us to the Lord and the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs do just that but they do much more than that uh, and we'll be looking at some some details. You have a sheet of paper here uh, in front of you, or at least you had access to one if you wanted it. Uh, on this sheet of paper, I listed the five passages that you all were supposed to look at. And, and I'll be glad to look at those if you'd like to, to some extent. Uh, but we can do more than that. Let, let's talk, let's, let's get the big picture on what's going on in the book of Psalms and in the book of Proverbs. And then we can look at those passages and try to answer any uh, questions that you might have, and if I uh, don't know the answer, I'll just tell you, I don't know, or I could lie to you and, and, and fake it. I'm pretty good at that if I have to do that. <laughs> you can't teach it 32 years at the university level and not have to fake it sometimes. Uh, at least that's what I did. <laughs> uh, but if I don't know the answer tonight, uh, I'll just... I'll tell you, about, but ask any questions that you have. Feel free to. And by the way, raise your hand at any time or just speak up. And, and uh, there's always flexibility in the schedule. So whenever you want to talk about it, we'll try to do that. But let's look, first of all, at the big picture on the book of Psalms. In the Hebrew, the title of the book of Psalms is not Psalms. It is, in fact, Tahilim, use the Hebrew word. Tahilim uh, is based upon the same word from which hallelujah comes. T-E-H-I-L-L-I-M is how you spell the word, Tahilim. And the H-L-L -L in there is the same H-L-L. -L. It's, it's based upon a Hebrew word that's the same one that's on the, that's the basis for the word hallelujah. Now, if you didn't know, the word hallelujah means something, especially if you've lived in Texas for 14 years, the way I did, something like praise the Lord, y'all, okay? <laughs> um, and Or praise Yahweh. Y'all, if you want to take it that way, the I A H on Hallelujah is the is the word is a short form of the personal name of, of the Lord, and the uh, the H L L is the word praise. The book the book of Psalms is a book of praises, uh, praise to the Lord for the gifts that He has given, praise to the Lord for the help that He is in the darkest days of life. 
praise to the Lord for the gift of life itself. But um, from a Christian perspective, it's also praise for the fact that the creator God of the universe also became our savior, became one of us to live a life uh, that uh, did something that none of us could do for ourselves. Paid, he, he shed his blood to pay for our sins. And more than that, he broke death by, by breaking out of the tomb. Uh, a thoroughly dead, absolutely murdered individual came back to life and opened up the way of eternal life for all who place their faith in him as Lord and Savior. And uh, even uh, Christians, when they looked at the life of Christ and when they read the book of Psalms, they said, wow, Jesus is in this book. This is surprising, but true. And we'll look at a couple of passages where that would be true. But uh, one of them happens to be one of the five passages that you were all asked to uh, to read, or at least were invited to read as part of your 100 passages. The one that Mark sent me as number one on your list is uh, Psalm 23, where it does say, and, and you're familiar with this, of course, some of you have totally memorized that psalm. You've sung parts of it, whatever. The Lord is my shepherd. Adonai etc., etc. The Lord is my shepherd. Okay. Now, when when people who had been raised in the Jewish tradition and who followed Jesus during his days on earth heard him speak on more than one occasion, but certainly on one occasion, he called himself the good shepherd. And uh, that was no accident on his part when Jesus said that. He was deliberately connecting himself with the great shepherd of Psalm 23. Uh, Jesus is that one uh, who does what only a shepherd can do with sheep. First of all, he knows his sheep. Uh, he protect. He lays down his life for the sheep. But he also leads them and guides them to, uh, to places of rest and renewal. And all the things that the, that the good shepherd of Psalm 23 um, is said to do, Jesus says, I do those and even more, and even more. And uh, so when Christians used the book of praises as a, a window into the life and ministry of Jesus. Um, one more key example, and it's... Uh, very clear from reading the, the passages in the four Gospels of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when they describe the key moment in Jesus' life, out of all the 30-plus years that Jesus lived, the most important day in Jesus' life was the day that he died for the sins of all humanity. And that day is given special emphasis in each of the uh, four Gospels. They all go into great detail uh, on uh, the arrest of Jesus, his uh, trials, his flogging, his crucifixion itself. And as the four writers describe the life of Jesus, they do so with a direct knowledge of the book of Psalms. You're, I'm sure, familiar with this passage. If you have studied uh, the Psalms as a Christian for many years, or maybe read books about it, but Psalm 22 is um, the psalm that precedes the Good Shepherd psalm. And um, when, when the, the Christian writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, wrote their, their story of Jesus, and especially that story about the most important day in Jesus' life, in fact, arguably the most important day in all of human history, they looked to the psalms to guide them in their presentation. As Jesus was dying on the cross on that day, he said a number of sayings, but one of them that is mysterious to a lot of, to all of us really, but, but fascinating, is actually a direct quote from the book of Psalms. I'm reading from Psalm 22, verse 1. See if this doesn't sound kind of familiar, if you know the story of Jesus. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Eli, Eli, lama salachtani, in the uh, Aramaic, actually, Jesus spoke Aramaic in the first century, but the uh, that's a direct quotation from 
uh, the Aramaic, which is based upon the Hebrew of, of this of this passage right here. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Uh, it's a powerful psalm in and of itself and was not and it was one that was thought about a lot by Jews before the days of Jesus exactly what's going on in this psalm uh, it's said to uh, be a psalm of David you may recall that David was the founder of the messianic line he was the one who whom God chose out of all the possible kings of Israel uh, to be the one who would be the founder of the line of uh, that would be of the line of Israel's chosen kings and 22 kings in the Old Testament in the family line of David. Uh, but um, of those 22 descendants, but of those, um, none of them lived up to the hopes that Israel had for what a Messiah should be. Uh, David, the writer of this psalm, was also one who um, founded the line of kings that would ultimately lead to the one king that would fulfill the prophecies found in 2 Samuel chapter 7, a king that would uh, be forever on the throne of Israel, and no earthly king could do that. A king who would be known as the son of, of God, would be, would be the son of God. 2 Samuel 7 speaks of these kinds of things. And Jesus, to identify himself as that one, Pick this one psalm of David to have a direct quote from which to have a direct quotation. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? Other passages in the Old Testament tell us why God seemed to be so far at that point. It's because Jesus had to become the remedy for all of human sin, that all the sins of humanity were laid upon uh, the the soul of Jesus, and uh, Jesus bore the weight of every human sin that could ever be committed. There is no sin that was not carried by Jesus, however awful or seemingly unforgivable it might be. Every sin was carried by Jesus and was paid for through the shed blood of the, of the God-man for us, for all eternity. Uh, bearing that weight of all human sin on the cross was apparently a, a task that was so difficult that Jesus sweat drops of blood beforehand, uh, and um, and it was it almost overwhelmed him, and ultimately he he died as a result of uh, paying the price. But he certainly felt abandoned by God at that very dark moment in his life. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, description of Jesus, as recorded in the scriptures clearly was written with a with the life of Jesus on uh, in the minds and hearts of the writers and the Old Testament passage in Psalm 22 in their other hand. Both of these uh, come together as we can see in Psalm 22, uh, beginning actually in um, verse 18 of chapter 22. The book of Psalms is a Christian work finds uh, a direct prophecy pointing to the most important day in all of human history, beginning in, in many ways with verse 1, but then picking up at verse 18, notice what it says. Uh, well, let's start with, uh, let me actually probably better if I started with verse 16. For dogs have surrounded me. The uh, Hebrew word for dog mm -hmm. can mean a literal dog, but oftentimes it was used to refer to uh, people who were outside of the covenant relationship with God, uncircumcised unbelievers who had no respect for God and um, were animalistic in their in their behavior. Let's just leave it like that. And so um, they're in verse 16. Dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I'll tell you that in Old Testament days, Jews never practiced crucifixion, which did involve the, the piercing of the hands and the feet. For, uh, for those who read this passage prior to the days of Jesus, this passage would not have made sense to them. This was a prophecy pointing to a future event 
hundreds of years after the days when David penned it under the, under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He goes on, I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. <laughs> Uh, the writer is describing here exactly one of the more horrific aspects of crucifixion, and that is the stripping of the individual just prior to their, their uh, crucifixion. Uh, they would be left with absolutely no clothing on and they just nailed to that piece of wood and left to die in a very prominent position up in the air where people could see them. Uh, <clears throat> and, and yet Jesus says, uh, you Lord don't be far away now he never quoted that we don't hear him say that in the New Testament but uh, I would suggest to you that something of what was going on in Jesus soul at that time is, is given to us an interior view of the life of Christ at that moment is suggested in all of this it's, it's a powerful passage though and my point again is that the book of Psalms was used by Christians to point them to Jesus and whether it be uh, Psalm 23, the great shepherd, the, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, whether it be Psalm 22, as we see right here, or whether it be other passages that, uh, that we could spend all evening looking at, uh, biblical writers, bi biblical uh, scholars in the Christian world for 2,000 years have looked for and found Jesus in the, in, in the book of Psalms. Having said that the book of Psalms for Christians is a book that points us to Jesus, there is much more to it than that. Uh, the book of Psalms, the book of praises, uh, has, uh, is, a, is a music book um, that speaks to all of life for the Christian. Uh, I've given you some of the subject categories on your handout if you wanted to look at that for just a moment. Some of the different things that are some of the different categories of psalms that, that are mentioned in, in the book of Psalms are are, are here. Uh, do y'all still use your paper psalm uh, hymn books anymore? Usually. Okay, they're at least still in the in, in the fuse. <laughs> okay. I never thought I'd see a day when when paper would be out of fashion and, and there wouldn't be books anymore. Uh, but with uh, all the digital resources, we don't have them like we used to. Um, but in a way that actually takes us back to um, to the days when when the Book of Psalms was written, that there was no affordable paper uh, or a way to write these down in in ancient Israel. And so um, when people wanted to remember things, when people wanted to uh, remember anything from uh, the stories of human, uh, of their, their cultural history, the great story, the stories of their great heroes in life, uh, the theology, the teachings of, uh, that, that guide your religion, that the values, all of these would be turned into songs. Everything, uh, everything in, um, in ancient Israelite religion was, was turned into a chant, at least. Whether or not it was a, a best-selling song, it was at least chanted. Uh, and, and there's a reason for that. When you want to remember an important detail, when you're trying to teach your child, for example, the alphabet, do you just give them a piece of paper with 26 letters on it and say, okay, kid, I'm gonna test you on this tomorrow. Uh, I know you're only three years old, but this is this is what you got to learn. And you had a piece of paper. No, it's not what you do. You sing a song. And that alphabet song uh, gets into the, the brain of a child. And maybe maybe Stephen could help us understand how the human brain is able to lock, uh, to combine music and, and thoughts together uh, in a permanent uh, structure. But... Uh, and maybe you can give a talk on it. How does that work in the human mind? Another day. Okay. Okay. This, and, is, this is your time. Okay. Yeah. But it is true that if you can if you can ever sing words, you're going to have those words probably for a lifetime. My wife loves to sing, and uh, she can she can remember exact lyrics of songs that she hasn't sung since she was a teenager uh, in North Carolina in the local church, but. 
when she needs those lyrics, if, if she ever hears a tune, she's got the words right there and she hadn't thought about them for 40 years. Uh, it is amazing how uh, music has the ability to preserve important truths for us. And so without books, because everything was written down on leather, uh, you have to kill an animal to write something down back in those days and then have very carefully preserved, very beautifully preserved leather to do that. Or you'd have to import very expensive woven weeds, papyrus from Egypt to write stuff down. And, uh, and no one could afford to do that. So you just sang, you turned everything into music and you, and you had it all whenever you needed it. And so the book of Psalms um, gives us all of that. Oh, by the way, when am I supposed to wrap this up? We usually wrap it up when we hear the army of kids coming down the stairs. Yeah. Which is approximately 740 ish. Okay. So we can have an hour. We'll try to balance these things out. Uh, Psalms and Proverbs. Well, you'll know when it's time. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So what kind of things did, did they turn into songs that could that they could carry with them in the good times and in the bad times and make the good times better with music and the dark times a little brighter? Well, I have listed some of the subject categories uh, there in, uh, on this page here. Remember that the name of the book in the Hebrew, Tahili, means praises. There is a lot of praise found in the book. Uh, if there's one thing that can, can help carry, I think, anybody through life, uh, it is the, the certain knowledge that there is someone that is bigger than my problems that cares for me and is close to me and is able and willing to help me. That's something that you can sing about. That's something that... To, to praise, to give praise for. And uh, the book of Psalms from the very beginning recognizes the fact that in every problem of life, there is a God there who cares for us and who will help us. And uh, you can all kind, ma many, many Psalms celebrate this fact. And let's look at one or two, just a couple of verses. I, I listed on this page, Psalm 32, you have uh, actually Psalm 103 as I know that we'll look at for just a minute, but Psalm 32, as, as in a typical example of a praise psalm, uh, notice how it starts out there. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Uh, guilt is one of the most destructive forces in the human personality. Uh, it, it creates in, intense amounts of stress, it can lead to disease, it can lead to sleepless nights, it can lead to very bad behavior. Um, to, to gain forgiveness uh, sets you free. It, it gives you a freshness in life that nothing else can. David needed forgiveness at times in his life. And he celebrated the fact that there was a God who was bigger than his sin that was able to help him. How joyful is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How joyful is a person whom the Lord does not charge with iniquity, and in whose spirit is no deceit. David is celebrating uh, God's forgiveness right there. He celebrated many other things uh, in terms of uh, the, the gifts of God to us. We're going to, because of time constraints, so, uh, we, we could look at many of the Psalms, but we're going to go to Psalm 103, and let's take a moment to look at that Psalm that was on your reading list, if you had time and the inclination to look it over. Uh, Psalm 103, first couple of verses there. My, my soul, bless the Lord. By the way, that word Lord right there is in all caps in my version. It probably is in yours as well. That all caps is a shorthand way of uh, the Bible translators uh, used to indicate that that's the personal name of God right there. Uh, a Jew could never say this, a reverent Jew, but we, but as Christians, we're allowed to actually pronounce the Lord's name. My soul, bless Yahweh, is really what the, what the original language says right there. This is a psalm written by David, and it, it shows something beautiful and important 
That is that David was on a first name basis with the Lord God, with the creator God of the universe. Are you on a first name basis with God? He invites us uh, to, he invites us to, to be in a relationship that personal with him. There are, uh, are certain politicians and judges, if you're in a court of law, you really don't talk to the judge while you're in a court of law by their first name. That's, that's just a no-no. Uh, to talk to the Lord God, the creator of the universe, the forgiver of our sins on a first name basis is absolutely an astounding reality that we all too often as Christians take for granted. And, and yet, um, David did that and modeled that for us in his 103rd Psalm. My soul, bless, and reverently I say this, Yahweh, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. My soul, bless the Lord, and do not forget all his benefits. Um, it's easy. My wife and I um, are on our way to um, Canada, actually, for the third time, we're going to be teaching up there for a third semester and beginning in January. If anybody wants to borrow a dog for five months, uh, <laughs> we're looking for a, a dog sitter. Mark said I could advertise. Absolutely. Uh, Shamelessly. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we genuinely do need a dog sitter. That's the one thing the Lord hasn't yet given us. Uh, and uh, we've got a, a lovable dog. Talk to me later if you're interested. But uh, but I will say this. We, we, we live half an hour from the Canadian Rockies, the, that beautiful, rugged set of mountains that Hallmark Christmas movies have used and abused for many, many movies. And uh, they are gorgeous to wake up to in the morning. But it, after you've been there for a whole semester, you don't... The, you don't do what you did the first couple of days you were there, and that is get out of bed and just run to the window and watch the sunrise on those snow-laden mountains in January. Uh, you remember that, oh yeah, the mountains are out there somewhere. Yeah, and yeah, we'll, we'll go out and see them sometime. But you begin to take it for granted. Well, I hate to say it, but a lot of times the blessings that God gives us are very much like that. They're incredibly valuable. They're in, they're the gift of forgiveness, the gift of provision of food and a place to stay and Christian friends and so many other things in life are, are amazing and priceless blessings. Yeah, but we get used to them. And uh, if we get around to it, we may thank him for it every now and then, uh, but not, not with the depth that, that we should. And, and the writer reminds us that one, one of the things we can do and the book of Psalms is so beautiful about this, of modeling ideal, uh, the ideal Christian life. Do what the psalmist suggested right here. And that is, don't forget, don't forget the good things he's done. Do not forget all his benefits. Um, well, he forgives all your, and then, and then the psalmist goes to describe some of these things. Apparently, David had committed a lot of sins. And so the thing that really stood out, his headliner was, First, second of all, first of all, I got to tell you, he forgave me of my sins. He, uh, he forgives all your iniquity, he says, too. It's not just David's iniquity. It's, it's our iniquity. Jesus died for everybody. He heals all your diseases. Uh, we, we all know of people who suffer from disease. But isn't it great to know that one of the, one of the realities is that within, <clears throat> within the Christian experience, there's coming a day, and it may be on the other side of eternity, Sometimes it's on this side of eternity when all of our diseases will be healed. Uh, but we have a God who fixes what's broken. We have a God who heals us, both body, soul, and spirit. Uh, and, and that gift of healing is incredibly uh, precious to those who have been near to death but found the healing experience. Uh, or had a nagging chronic condition of some sort that was finally relieved. I think about Michelle Harley, and with, uh, uh, it would be wonderful if she could be relieved of uh, all those horrible, horrible symptoms that she's had for, since COVID began. Uh, we have a God who heals all our diseases. That's something worth praising him for. Uh, he redeems your life from the pit. Uh, uh, Mishachat in the Hebrew, but from, from destruction, from, from the pit. Um, David was a soldier. David uh, had many life and death experiences on the battlefield like none of us would ever want to have. And he survived every one of them. 
uh, they would uh, sometimes just throw the bodies into pits. Well, David was redeemed. From, David did never end up in a pit uh, because God protected him in a time of great threat to his life. He uh, redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. A lot of us have had broken relationships that create much pain in our lives. Isn't it wonderful to know that there is one being, at least one being in the universe that will always love us and always have warm feelings toward us? And that one being is our creator, God, and also the one who will judge us someday. That is something to praise God for. Uh, they call this the book of praises for a reason because there are a lot of, there, there are huge numbers of reasons to praise God. Um, he satisfies you with good things. Uh, he gives us uh, friends. He gives us food. Uh, that was, uh, Matt is, one of Matt's gifts is just food. Let's just, he knows, he knows how to select good things and prepare them well. And Martha and I always enjoy coming over here for the meals. <laughs> so you can invite us back again. Uh, just make sure it's a Wednesday night. And that's good. <laughs> Uh, and we could go on and on. Let's just say that the book of Psalms is a book of praises. And um, it, it's a book that recognizes that God is in nature and is uh, at work for good in nature uh, through, through the eyes of faith. And even if you're a semi-agnostic, when you see the beautiful colors of fall, and we've, we've had a rich array of colors this year um, in the last few weeks, it's easy to to want to thank somebody for all that beauty out there. Well, um, Christians know who to thank, and, and the psalmist did too. The psalmist, in, in more than one psalm, just ticks off 20 and more different things that, that they look around and, and see and hear in nature, they, and they think, God did that. God did that. Look at that. God did that over there too. And this idea of um, praising God for his works in nature it is one of the things that is celebrated and praised in, in the book of praises. Uh, the fact we have a God who works in history. Uh, there's an old and incorrect and unchristian theory, uh, though it is uh, a religious theory, a theological theory, that says that God created the universe. Yes, he did. And then he left it. He, he uh, designed it. He, it's a perfectly working clock. It, there's a mainspring at work in it. It's, it's got the energy that it needs to continue forward. And God built it so perfectly that he just doesn't mess with it anymore. It just takes care of itself. But that's not the Christian view. The Christian view is that God is intimately involved in every person's life. And more than that, he's involved in the lives of families. He's involved in the lives of communities and in the whole world. And so you actually have a couple of psalms that talk about how God was actively at work among his people, both to bless and to curse. Uh, God is a, a caring and moral God who um, gave us, who, who revealed to us what we, what we should do, the, the values that we as human beings should hold in life. But he also holds us accountable for living according to those values. And when we depart from those values, there's a price to be paid. And we have a God who loves us so much that he won't let us get by with bad behavior. If you're a parent, you know the importance of not letting your kids during those formative years get by with bad behavior. And you have to, you have to intervene. You have to stop it. And it's not pretty, but it's necessary. Some of the Psalms, a very few of them, talk about how God worked in Israel's history as a nation. And when Israel was doing God's thing like a good child, they were praised and blessed. And when they decided to rebel against God and just go their own way, the loving God said, I can't let you do that. This is, this is a way of death. It will ruin you. And so God intervened and brought judgment upon his people, but always in love. And you have historical psalms that, that re recount some of the d details of history and how God actively was at work in this universe in which he cares more about your life than you do. He cares more about your good behavior and your nation's good behavior than, than you and your politicians do. And he will act to enforce his, his judgments. Uh, 
you have all kinds of other psalms that we, we could look at, but we better better touch on Proverbs and maybe even leave a little room. Uh, Going back yes, to the singing in the end of memory. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is in Hebrew. So I imagine that the meter of how that's put together acoustically sounds a little different in Hebrew than it does in English when we try to translate this. Yes, it, it does. It's usually a three, four type meter, something like that, uh, whatever that means. Um, I'm not a musician. I have to talk to my wife about it, something like that. And Martha did not come prepared to sing stuff in Hebrew tonight, so do not ask her to do that. <laughs> Oh, no, I can't. You don't want to hear me. <laughs> but um, it, it was it was more of a chant. OK, this stuff was was. Uh, but somehow chants also lock stuff in in our brain. I, I don't know how it works, but it does. Part of that is because the brain is wired for structure. Oh. And, and, and meter and acoustic recording things creates a structure that's kind of predictable that actually helps make it organized. Huh. And it's called acoustic acoustic memory or acoustic. Oh, well, there you go. Acoustic memory. Ta -da. And, and who built that into the human brain? God did. Uh, uh, God really does want music to be part of worship. Okay, and I say that as a non-musician, a proud non-musician. Okay, but I do recognize that, that music uh, was is by God's design an essential part of training your children, of uh, of worshiping God, of passing on the faith to the next generation. So when you sing, sing songs that are full of God's truth. Okay, sing songs that are worth remembering because the kids are going to remember. Them. And when I think about some of the stuff that's on the internet and some of the stuff that they can download from iTunes, I think, why are we allowing that filth to be locked into their brains? Oh, my goodness. Uh, but Christians have an alternative. And so let's, let's make it as good as we can and fill it with the best stuff we can. So the book of Proverbs. Mashalim. Proverbs. <coughs> What is a proverb? Well, uh, first of all, the book of Proverbs was not written uh, originally to be read by everybody. You got to understand that this was uh, that no one owned books and where there were repositories of books, it would be in the holy places. Uh, Levites owned a few uh, sacred writings on leather and uh, the royal palace had scrolls as well because kings needed to keep track of records. And also, one other thing, they needed to educate the next generation uh, of, of future leaders. The book of Proverbs was actually one of the textbooks used in the Royal uh, Academy. The, the place never explicitly mentioned or given any detailed uh, description in the Bible, but which we know was uh, um, utilized by Solomon and probably funded by Solomon as, as the founder of this Royal University, Royal Academy, where he would train the younger generation of future leaders, males only, in the Royal Palace for the leadership roles that would guide the nation forward. And um, so what we're when we read the book of Proverbs, what we are looking at is actually an actual ancient textbook that was used to prepare people for the most important administrative <laughs> positions within the covenant community among the people of God. So if Solomon is not the only contributor to the book of Proverbs, but he's the primary contributor. I might say that David is not the only author of the Psalms, but he's the primary one. 73 of the Psalms, for what it's worth, are explicitly attributed to David, okay? But you have many others, uh, and I've listed several uh, there in the who wrote the psalm section. Well, Solomon is not the only one who wrote the Proverbs, but he but he was famous for having written more and, again, being the founder of the Royal Academy. And so he's given primary credit. And as the as Israel's wisest king, if you're trying to train the next generation, you know you're not going to live forever. And you don't want to be king forever. You want to have a little retirement time if you can. Um, but you want to have somebody competent to, to, to lead after you. What, what things do you want that next generation to buy into? What things do you want them to keep front and center to guide them as they are making decisions that will affect literally millions of people? Well, number one, on Solomon's list, the 
for him was absolutely the most important thing. If you don't learn anything else, guys, learn this one thing. It would be that somebody making a statement to that effect. It was this. Yirak Adonai Tahilat Da'at. Okay. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, actually, it says uh, in, in Proverbs chapter one. Uh, you, you, don't, you, you may think you know a lot of things, but if you don't know this one truth, if you don't have this one thing right, you ain't got nothing, okay? Everything's going to be out of kilter. I, I guess vinyl records are kind of making a comeback. I mean, I thought that they were going to die back in the 80s and 90s, but they're back. Uh, and I don't know why, but but one of the things I remember about because I don't like I don't listen to music. Music's not my thing. Okay, it's my wife's thing. All right, all right. So so here's this this vinyl record. Well, what is in what is in a vinyl record? What is that? What is at the very center of a vinyl record? A hole. Why? So that the thing will be playable. Uh, and 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 the music will sound right when it does play. You you put it on this spinning disc type thing, and so you set it down on it. And if you don't have that thing perfectly centered, with that that little hole in the middle, with that one thing that's designed to fit in that hole, that music is not going to sound right, and you could even damage the record. Okay, and so that welcome to life. This is what Solomon said. Life is like as well. There is that spot in the vinyl record that is your soul, that is your life, that has a little hole in it, and that hole has to be filled with God, and it has to be the fear of God, not just not just a knowledge, a general knowledge. Yeah, there's a God out there somewhere. No, we're talking about the fear of God, the recognition that there is a very powerful God who is watching everything you do and who will hold you responsible for every decision that you make in life. And he is more than ready to whip you, to, to hurt you bad if you don't do what he asks you to do, okay? Solomon said, until you can get that into your brain, that, that you have, a, you have a, something missing in the center of your life and only God can fill it. And you better pay attention to that God and not just generally recognize that he's there. You, you better actively be aware that he, he's watching you carefully and he is prepared to bless you and make your life better if you're doing what he tells you to do. But he's also just as willing to hurt you if you don't do what he tells you to do. Um, my wife and I, well, back here, one of your sisters is married to a guy who is the chief electrician at uh, the North Carolina Port, uh, Port Authority on the coast of North Carolina. He worked with really powerful uh, wattage and voltage electricity. And one mess up on his part in his daily job, and he was dead in a fraction of a second. He had to be very careful with the way that he used electricity. Uh, may I suggest to you that as careful as a smart, well-paid electrician uh, is around electricity, we need to be even more careful when we're around God. And we're always around God. You, you, a, a good electrician never takes the power of electricity for granted. They recognize that one mess up and they're dead. Well, as Christians, as future leaders uh, in the, in, who studied the book of Proverbs as one of their textbooks, Solomon said, you need, to, you need to remember one thing. God needs to be the one thing you do fear. You don't need to fear your enemies. God's bigger than your enemies. You don't need to fear poverty. You don't need to fear hunger. Uh, you, you do need to fear God. Because God is the one who uh, can remedy every problem that you've got, who can defeat any enemy that you'll ever face, but who will also be the one who will be your worst enemy if you try to fight him. You'll always lose. Don't ignore God. <laughs> the, the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of true knowledge. And until you learn that, nothing else is going to quite make sense. Someone once said that if you uh, educate a, well, sermons or something you, you get a smart uh you get a smart pagan and you, and you educate them oh it was uh, larry lewis said something like that uh at, at the uh, booster gala whatever it was uh, that you, you can take a person who um is 
who doesn't, who's not a Christian, and you can give them a world-class education, but if you give a non-Christian with terrible values a great education, what you get is a smart pagan, and a smart pagan can be a powerful pagan, and he can hurt you. Uh, a, a smart, uh, wealthy pagan can do a lot of damage in life. That's why, um, historically, we've uh, used a character requirement for um, leading, leading roles uh, in, in public school hirings and that kind of thing. Have somebody who's going to be uh, well-educated, but also has a good character. Because um, in a position of power, they, if, if their soul is bent, they, they will bend the use of resources to hurt people and, and just use them for their own personal gain. Hurt a lot of people in the process. Solomon recognized that uh, the people uh, who were going to be fu Israel's future leaders needed to be people of morality. They needed to not only fear the Lord, but to do what is right at all times. And um, so the book of Proverbs has been, uh, has been called really a commentary on the Ten Commandments. And in many ways, it, it really is. Uh, you think about the, the ethical and moral code of the Ten Commandments, respect for human life, respect for marriage, respect for property, other people's property, all that kind of thing. Uh, all of that is, is wrapped up in, in the virtues and vices that are discussed in the book of Proverbs. And uh, we could look at some of those. But at uh, 7.35, uh, one of the things that we can just look at a couple of these real quickly. Uh, just uh, again, you're you're trying to get people to lead the nation and and get their values right. That now they now they fear the Lord. They've got Him in the center of it. But what other things do you have to do besides being a genuine God fearing person? Well, Psalm uh, Proverbs 15, for example, uh, gives us a suggestion or two. If I can get there real quickly. There we go. Um, you learn to use your tongue why, uh, well. You, uh, the, in the New Testament, the half-brother of Jesus, James, will, will talk about the power of the human tongue uh, to do good and to, and to do bad. So, uh, but he was picking up on a theme that also Solomon, one of his relatives from uh, 1000 BC, uh, had mentioned as well. A gentle answer turns away anger. But harsh words stir up wrath. Uh, kings who don't know how to control their emotions can start wars. Okay, you've got to be very careful, especially in the diplomatic realm, to use the right words and have the right tone. Solomon understood that. It's always been true in, in sensitive international relations. And so um, a gentle answer turns away wrath. Uh, great Great advice, not just good, for future. Good marital advice, too. Good marital advice. <laughs> I'll take that. I, I, you've been, maybe done a little marital counseling once or twice in your entire that. life. <laughs> Wrote a book about it. Wow, okay. Uh, and every, every level of human relationships, from the most personal one in a marriage to international relationships, uh, between North Korea and the United States, or whatever it might be, um, need to learn how to use the tongue and to follow Proverbs 15. And, and that was true in Solomon's day as well, I might say. So the, uh, verse four in that same chapter, again, the power of the tongue. The tongue that heals is a tree of life. Have you ever had somebody, when you're really hurting someone speak a word of encouragement to you? Uh, when you were very discouraged, someone said, I, I believe in you, you know, and uh, you need to, uh, whatever they, whatever word you needed, they just happened to speak exactly what you needed. And you just felt transformed when you heard those words. The, the power, Solomon recognized that power uh, in, in his day. The tongue that heals is a tree of life. It's interesting that tree of life um, actually, it seems like there's a tree of life uh, in, in Genesis chapter 2, a tree of life which if people ate from that tree, they would never die. It, it was it, 
and, and no, no, no one ever got to eat from that tree because they were kicked out of the garden before they could. Uh, but, but there was this, this concept that um, there was something that can give lasting life. Solomon's picking up actually on, on that image in the Torah right there and says that what Adam and Eve never got to eat, you can give as a gift to another person, uh, a gift of a word of healing to another person. Uh, it's, it's a tree of life, but a devious tongue, tongue breaks the spirit. Uh, it, the Hebrew word break right there is literally to shatter into small pieces. Uh, counselors have to deal with broken people that are just shattered. And, uh, and if, if you've ever experienced a uh, really difficult breakdown in, uh, emotionally, psychologically, whatever, you don't get over those things in a day. It, 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 you may never get over them in a lifetime. Uh, he, healing something that a, a broken spirit is a very difficult thing to, to fix. And Solomon says, be careful because words are hammers and they can break sensitive spirits. And once they're broken, it's very difficult to put them back together. You shatter them. Uh, I've, I've got a couple of broken coffee cups that my, my wife has to watch me glue back together from time to time because it's got one or two little broken pieces. I cannot glue together a coffee cup with a thousand broken pieces. Okay, I don't, I don't we don't, we don't do that. Uh, but uh, words have the power to heal and the power to shatter. Be careful how you use them. Uh, with a few moments that we probably have left, unless they had a really good session upstairs, uh, we can go to uh, one of the most beautiful passages uh, in, um, in the Old Testament when it comes to uh, the importance of a supportive and, and godly spouse. Remember, this is written to males only. Women were never allowed to study this book in Old Testament days. And you could not be a politician within that culture without also being married. And married. And married. <laughs> you could have a lot of, um, a lot of wives. Uh, but, but, um, but Solomon is focusing on really the godly design of one husband and one wife in a, a marital bond for life. And uh, within, within the 31st chapter, King Lemuel, who we don't know even who he is, there's no Lemuel mentioned in, in all of the Old Testament. Uh, was this another name for Solomon? Some rabbis speculated that. Uh, was this uh, a friend of Solomon's uh, from another culture who had godly wisdom and Solomon uh, probably brought it into his faith uh, and, and into his textbook. We don't know where it came from, but uh, included in Solomon's textbook here, beginning in verse 10, is a 22-verse poem slash uh, collection of wisdom sayings uh, that actually uh, was a chant, an alphabetic acrostic type thing, where you had 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet a to Z, whatever, all up to top, and uh, everyone, and there were 22 letters in their alphabet, and so every one of these 22 verses from uh, 10 to the end of the book of Proverbs um, has a different letter of the alphabet in the order of the Hebrew alphabet uh, in this psalm, and, and it describes um, something that every, every husband wants in a wife, but if you stop to reflect on it even for just a little bit every person needs to be in their relationship with another person okay to, to make families work what does it take to make a family work well um as described here as a woman who can find a wife of noble character um, and um that's that's a great question. Uh, can you find them on the internet? How, how do you find these things? Dating sites? How do you come up with a person that, that can be as uh, what this says? Well, you can try. Uh, I know college students all the time uh, try these dating sites uh, once they fail with the 
girls in the dorm down uh, on the other side of campus or whatever. Uh, but but actually, uh, what I tell the students is, you, you, first of all, you need to be the right person before you can find the right person. And so get yourself mature, get your values right, get some practice at holding to those values when it's not easy so that you've got a little bit of battle experience in there. And then maybe you then maybe you can find the right person, but you got to be the right person first. And uh, but who can find a wife of noble character? Implicit in that is that you need to be a person of noble character. Okay, Solomon or Lemuel, whoever wrote this, uh, implicitly has a, a subtext to all these things. Who who can find a wife of noble character? She is far more precious than jewels. Uh, the term paninim right there, the, the, there's actually a woman named Panina in the Old Testament. It's based upon the same word. Could be pearls, jewels, I don't know what they were. But anyway, so, something of great value. Uh, a, a woman, uh, uh, which is more valuable? Uh, a $100,000 drive it off the lot, really fancy new car. And you can pay if you really go to the right place, it's $100,000 for a new car or a person who will be with you, uh, loyal to you, loving to you, sir, uh, sharing life with you uh, in the dark moments and the good moments of life, which is more valuable, having a, a lifetime relationship with a beautiful person or having a car that's gonna uh, depreciate 10 minutes after you drive it off the lot, no matter how, if you pay $100,000 for it or whatever, you do, it doesn't matter. Solomon would say that, or whoever Lemuel is, is going to say that relationship with that person, that person is far more valuable than any thing you can ever get, whether it be pearls, whether it be rubies, whether it be uh, a jewel, whatever it is. Uh, relationships, people are more important than things, okay? The heart of her husband trusts in her. What is it that makes a marriage work? Trust, okay? Uh, there are guys who will put trackers on their wives' cars to try to see if they're cheating on them and things like that. They'll have cameras hidden in places so they'll see if somebody's being faithful to them and that sort of thing. Uh, and people who do those kind of things do not trust their spouse. And I can tell you that they're not gonna have a happy marriage unless there's trust there. Uh, you, trust gives us a, a calm, it, it gives us a confidence um, that, that keeps a relationship smooth and strong. And if you lose that trust and you start have to put trackers on vehicles and hidden cameras and hidden recorders and stuff like that, you, you've got a broken marriage. You, you've got something that, that isn't going to last and it, it's sad and I'm sorry for you. Um, but if you've got the right kind of person, if, if, if they've got a character that is, first of all, true to God, they're going to be true to you, too. Uh, I always encourage uh, people to marry Christians. Be a Christian and marry a Christian. Um, because a Christian's primary duty is to be faithful to God. And when they do that, they'll be faithful to you, too. Uh, the heart of her husband trusts in her, and he'll not lack anything good. But he may lack time because time is I'm, 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 hearing, I'm hearing the army descending. I'm going to hand you this yeah. <laughs> Uh Thank you so much, Dr. Bergen. That was wonderful tonight. And it's really appreciated. Thank you. And, and, uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, and I failed earlier tonight, and I owe I owe Miss Martha an apology. I we did not formally welcome you here tonight. This is Dr. Martha Bergen, Dr. Bergen, and Dr. Bergen, and she is the uh, professor of Christian Education Emerita at Hanwell Grange University, and uh, an accomplished scholar in her own right. So it's a, you're a great couple. So thank you for being here. Okay. All right. Uh, if you want to have have questions. Uh, Bob, I'm sure he'd, he'd love to visit with you afterwards, but why don't we close with prayer, and uh, I think they're descending. Oh, there's one of them over there right now. Okay, that's right. God, we love you, and we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word tonight. 
We thank you so much for Dr. Bob Bergen sharing about the Psalms and about Proverbs. And may we uh, really uh, just uh, think deeply about what we've learned and, and, and internalize uh, what it means to, uh, to live into your promises uh, as revealed in your word, which point to your sin. So be with us as we leave here tonight and to be with those who are in need of healing. And I forgot to mention John Furman earlier, who's been in the hospital for several days. We pray for healing for John. We pray this, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody online. Yeah, well, pleasure listening to you.